Today uh, we have the pleasure of uh, having with us a good friend of mine, uh, Professor Sebastian Pokuta from the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering. Uh, he's, uh, he's got a background that has many facets. One, I'll mention just one, that he's been an investment banker. Okay, so if you want to build projects with him, and uh, he's got a very interesting perspective uh, on things. Uh, Sebastian is at the crossing of industrial and systems engineering, operations research, and now very much into machine learning. Uh, he's, uh, every time of the year, you just ask uh, where he's going to be. And uh, you have to take planet Earth and try to pinpoint. Uh, in last month, he's probably been in, in Europe, in, in Asia, coming back here, going back. So his life is pretty hectic uh, along those lines and uh, talking and uh, interacting with many companies. Uh, he's one of the leaders in machine learning and uh, uh, very stimulated by getting many students involved in, in companies. So he's prepared for us like an overall uh, synopsis of uh, research and links with uh, uh, the industrial and systems uh, and supply chain the, the, and logistics domain related to material learning. I will not talk more, okay, uh, not as a material learning, uh, machine learning, sorry. I will not talk more uh, and let the floor to Sebastian. He's preparing the presentation roughly for an hour, okay, roughly in this, and then plenty of time for questions. So mark your, your questions, comments, and it, it's always open, free-flowing uh, after that. So again, thanks for coming. This is highly appreciated. And uh, let's have fun uh, with the Sebastian. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and I'm very happy to be here today to talk uh, about machine learning, artificial intelligence and applications of those technologies in machine learning, uh, in uh, supply chain and logistics. So the type of the talk today will be really much more of an overview type of a talk. So in the first half I'm talking a bit about machine learning, what is out there, why are people so excited about it, where does all the hype come from and so on and so forth. Uh, I will also talk a bit about the risks and the challenges involved in deploying these technologies in the real world. And then the second half of the talk, I will look at three specific uh, applications where we have deployed machine learning and AI within a supply chain and logistics context. And most of the things, so almost everything I'm talking about that we did is actually implemented and running in the real world. There's a very new project that we just started that is at the beginning, which is not, which, where we are working on, which has not yet been deployed within an industry context. All right, so where does all the hype come from? So the basic idea is that if you talk to people in machine learning, they think of machine learning and AI as being something like, the, like electricity. So the same thing that electricity did for the industries hundreds of years ago, the same type of impact people expect from machine learning to do throughout various industries. So there's this idea that if you deploy machine learning and AI, and I will use both of these terms interchangeably today, if you deploy these technologies within an industry context, that you can significantly transform whatever you are doing by adding a much more dynamic and smarter view on things. And that's really what motivated the statement here by Andrew Eng. So of course, if you, if you look at machine learning, uh, we are all aware that there's a lot of hype out there and everybody's talking about it and everybody's doing machine learning to an extent that if you actually go to people in, in the valley and talk to them, there's this, this running joke right now in the valley. It, it goes roughly like this. Whenever you go out and you try to raise funds, everybody's talking about AI. When you actually hire PhD students, you tone it down a notch and you're actually hiring ML PhD students or ML uh, talent. Then when you actually start to implement it, at the end of the day, it's very often not that sophisticated. Sophisticated. So you use uh, technologies that we have had for many, many years out there, like linear regression models and so on and so forth. So that's not what people really would consider AI. And then at the end of the day, when you actually debug your code, it's just a stupid printf type of statement, right? So that's what really comes down to. This is the running gag in the valley those days. And also, if you look at the Gartner hype cycle, which is always a very good indication where we are in terms of technologies, you will see that machine learning is right up here. So th this is considered the most overhyped technology out there. And yes, there is a lot of hype out there. And don't worry, once we are done with machine learning, this is going to go down. There is general purpose machine intelligence down here. So we have a next thing in store. So we will not be <laughs> unemployed anytime soon. So having said that, of course, there is a lot of hype. But I urge you to not underestimate the potential of a technology simply because there is a lot of hype in the system. 
right? I mean, it's, it's very easy to dismiss something by saying, yeah, that's all hype out there and nothing is going on and people are just talking. At the end of the day, what we have seen in many, many real world applications, machine learning and AI can make a big difference. Uh, irrespective of the hype factor. So I urge you to take a serious look at the technology and decide whether it can make a difference uh, for you. So having said that, so why is everybody so excited about machine learning and AI? And the basic idea is what I call the accelerated Pareto principle. So if you look at the, at the last 20 years, how industries have been working, then you will see that we have more and more companies, like, such as Google, Facebook, Uber, where you have a single company that is controlling a very, very large part of the market because you have economies of scale and the, you have the Matthew effect and the whole more gains more type of setup. So very, very few companies are extremely dominant. The idea, what people are thinking about, what AI is going to do is it will bring this even up a notch further so that you will have essentially one single entity or very, very few entities that will control most, if not all, of the artificial intelligence or machine learning type of infrastructure. And you see this already happening in some sense. All these big companies are raking up their uh, AI infrastructure. They have these huge clusters. And if you want to build something by yourself on the same scale, it's next to impossible to get the resources together to build something that is as competitive in terms of infrastructure. So we see already a start in what is called the AI arms race happening here. And I think that is really where the excitement comes from. There's a technology out there that as a, as a technology itself has the potential to transform many, many industries. And that's why people are very, very excited about it. And we have gone a long way. If you look, uh, if you look what we have done so far, we have been extremely successful with machine learning. They are autonomous vehicles. So this is my favorite example of a cyber physical system where you take a machine, you add some intelligence and sensors to it to make it smart. But there's something extremely interesting about the example of aut uh, autonomous vehicles. Look at the companies that are successful in that space. These are very often not your traditional car makers. Why is this so? Because building an autonomous vehicle is not an uh, engineering problem anymore. It's a software problem. And there's a huge disconnect between building a car, which we already know how to do, and building a self-driving car, where we have no idea to truly make it intelligent. Although we have figured out many, many things, and highway autonomy and things like this, we can basically consider it to be solved. And that's why these companies like Uber and Google are extremely strong in the machine learning space when it comes to uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, on top of that, what is also interesting, what you can see in that space, for example, is that there is a big trend to go away from building a autonomous car as a company by yourself. So the trend goes to building retrofit kits with autonomous sensors, software, technology that you retrofit and put, say, on a Volvo or something like this. That's, for example, what Uber does. And you reuse this type of already known knowledge in terms of building a car and just insource it in a smart way. And in fact, the car builder, in some sense, or manufacturer, becomes something like a supplier to the AI companies that build their autonomous vehicle. So that's in the autonomous vehicle space. So, and, and we have come a, f a very long way here. But, and, but then we also have come a very long way in, in specific applications where people have thought that we are many, many years away of being successful. So my example here is deep reinforcement learning, or deep learning as well. So why is this so? There was this idea, so, so the AI has been always very elusive. So the idea was always AI is exactly what you cannot yet do. So 50 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, it doesn't really matter, people said, well, you know, we can build all these computer programs, and it's amazing. But the moment we can build a program that can play chess, that is artificial intelligence. We just need to get to be able to play chess, have a computer beat the human champion in playing chess. That's intelligence. And then we did this, and we figured out actually playing chess is not so hard because you can just enumerate basically all the interesting moves, and you get very, very strong chess computers. And then people were like, yeah, you know, maybe that's not so intelligent after all. It's much more like a search problem that we can solve with current technology. And then it went on and on and on. There were many, many other things on the way. But there has been always one very interesting problem out there, and that has been Go. Why? Because Go is a game where you need to reason and be creative for a very, very long or extended period of time in terms of planning. And you cannot solve this problem by pure enumeration. The number of moves that you can make, the combinations are so high that the traditional approaches with which we have solved problems do not apply in that way anymore. 
And if you would have asked before this breakthrough people how long it would take until you would be able to beat uh, the, the world champion at playing Go in terms of artificial intelligence, everybody would have told you, oh, we are like 20 years out. It's not going to happen anytime soon. And then DeepMind showed up and they first uh, uh, beat the European champion and actually then uh, 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 teamed up with the European champion to use the European champion to actually train the system to then take on the world champion. And it was done with, with a deep learning, a deep reinforcement learning based approach with many, many other tricks to make it work at the end of the day. But it doesn't matter. What is the important message here is that it is unclear for many of these things how far we have come already. And if you ask experts where we are, it's not always clear that this judgment is, is, is spot on in terms of prediction. And we have come a very, very long way. And we have very, very strong technology out there. And most of these things, you now get them as libraries out of the box. Sure, you have to tune them and so on and so forth. And if you want to push things, you have to be very careful to make things work. But many of these things, the, let's say the vanilla type of things, are all available in libraries to everyone out there. Good. Now, having said that, then you say, well, that's all fair and square. You have all these problems that you can solve now with the technology. But there's one thing that we will be never able to put into a computer. And this discussion has been going on in many, many years. And this is this whole idea that, that there's this notion of creativity that is something that is very inherent to human thinking and that you cannot put into a computer. And just to give you a bit of perspective on this, I'm not saying that you can do this in all possible ways, but just to give you a bit of perspective, uh, let's look at this uh, work uh, which is called style imitation, okay? So what you see on the left here is, is a picture taken in tubing, I think. And now what they did is they trained a deep neural network essentially to imitate styles of known artists to redraw the picture. Okay, let's look at the examples. The first one, so the first one is in, in style of Vincent van Gogh. It's the same picture, just redrawn by the AI using a deep neural network to make this look like a van Gogh picture. And I would say if this is the original, this looks pretty good in terms of getting close to it. Similarly, uh, it was then uh, redrawn, why is it not working? Uh, redrawn in, in one of Picasso's style that you see down here, and another one, um, and another one in, in Kandinsky's sky. So it's the same picture redrawn by an AI uh, in terms of uh, deep learning. Now you will tell me again, oh yeah, this is not AI because you now know how it works, or this is not uh, creative because I tell you what the algorithm is to do this. And I say, ah, you know, now that I know this, it's maybe not what I consider creativity anymore. But the point that I want to make is a lot of things that we think that are very unique and special are actually maybe not that special at the end of the day, versus there are other things, of course, that uh, will be very special uh, uh, after all. All right, so this is just to give you a bit of an idea what you can do with AI and machine learning right now. And that's, of course, more on the, on the very broad side. Uh, having said this, of course, not everything is, is uh, is, is great when it comes to AI and machine learning. And in fact, if you talk to some people, they will tell you that they consider AI to be the biggest existential uh, threat to humanity. Uh, now, I actually very much subscribe to that statement, but for completely different reasons. I'm not so much scared about the Terminator scenario that uh, we build a Terminator that is going to wipe us all out. What I'm much more concerned with is the impact uh, on society. We have this technology, and this technology has the potential to significantly transform um, our workforce and how we do automation and so on and so forth. So if you look at the numbers, the numbers are actually quite staggering. So let me start with the graphic down here. So what you see here is what we have been monitoring over many, many years. That's the development of employment and productivity. And you see there has been a very nice correlation for many, many years. And then something happened around uh, 2000. And that's what people call the great decoupling. And the idea is that productivity has continued to rise significantly. You see this up there. Uh, however, employment remained flat. Why is this so? Because we started to very large scale, more aggressively uh, deploy industrial robots. And what happens is, you see this like Q1 2017, 32% more industrial robots deployed. Uh, between 1990 and 2007, every robot displaces six human jobs. And let's be realistic. You have to come up with a, with a way of, of managing this. You cannot just do this and say, well, you know, somebody else is going to deal with this issue and so on and so forth. And if you, for example, look at Adidas Georgia factory here, this whole factory is run by 160 human workers. That's something that is, that is, that is extremely impressive from a technological perspective, but grander scheme of things, 
think in terms of work for tra workforce transformation and societal impact, then there's something that we should be extremely aware of and think about in terms of how we want to move forward with this. I'm not suggesting that there is a specific solution or that I have the answer to this. All I'm saying is that we need to be aware of the uh, potential impact. And let's also be very frank about this. This is something that is very strongly enabled by things like machine learning and AI. If you look at industrial robots beforehand, they were very good at very precisely defined tasks. And, it's, and it took a very long time to train a robot to do a specific task or set them up. Now the game is very different. Just to give you an idea of how this is done nowadays, so this is from, uh, from one of KUKA's robots. Uh, let's have a look of how it's trained. I'm not going to run through the whole thing. But the idea is essentially that you teach the robot to perform a task by demonstration. So how does it go? You take the arm of the robot and you guide the arm to specific control points, have the robot memorize the control points and perform a certain task, now in this case picking up uh, the element here. And then once you're done with training the task, the robot will actually execute the task by itself. It might, there's versions out there where with AI you refine the task and so on and so forth to make it nicer over time so, and so on and so forth. But the point is you have now a way of setting up an industrial robot, which is much, much faster than what we would have done in the old days. I don't know if everyone, every, any one of you has seen how you train these robots or set them up beforehand. You program them. You have to be very precise. The elements have to be all in place. If there's a bit of variation, you have hard time. These things become very, very robust. And there's versions out there that use uh, a computer vision to, to uh, detect uh, shifts in position and so on and so forth. This is very fast in terms of training it, okay? Just to give you an idea where we are in terms of uh, using this technology. So that's just on the, on the workforce transformation side. But there's also many um, ethical challenges that I would like to mention. So and I don't want to go too much into detail, but I think one thing that is very important to understand is how the technology can be used and whether we are happy with this. Like one, one potential use, of course, is to use AI to predict um, and whether somebody is going to committing a crime or not. And here's the example of China, but there's many, many other countries and many, 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 many other entities that do exactly the same thing and use machine learning type of methodology to predict various behaviors of humans. Um, that's on the ethical side. Again, I'm not saying that I want to suggest a solution. I'm just saying that we should aw be aware of these challenges. And, 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 and now let's talk a bit about the actual risk of deploying these systems in the real world. Because we always talk about how amazing these systems are, but I think we also need to be very precise and honest about the vulnerabilities of these systems. And it's, and it's great if I deploy something at Google and I do this to classify some images and something happens. It's not a big deal. There's no human lives at stake. If I deploy these systems in the real world, for example, in autonomous vehicles, I do very much care how safe these systems are and whether they can be hacked or not. And let me just give you an example of what you can actually do. So this example, let me start with the one on the, on the left here. So this is an example of one of my former students that is now, uh, that, uh, that worked on this uh, together with his co authors that is now at Google. So this is the idea what they call adversarial patch. So how does it work? So what you have up here is a VGG16 network. This is an image classifier. You pre present this thing with an image, and it tells you what it sees. Okay? Image up here, you present this image here. Yes, there's a bit of a notebook, but clearly you see there is a banana in the picture. And the classifier also tells you, hey, with probability almost 100%, uh, or probability 1, I'm essentially sure that what you see is a banana. Great. Now what you do is you can actually build these patches here. So they look like coasters, small like, like, like chips, like, like coasters that you put under your glass, very small ones. And you compute them in a special way so that they actually, when you put them into the image, they hack the image processing that is happening within the AI, okay? That's an adversarial patch. So what you do is you take this coaster, and you see the size here roughly. This is the banana and this is the actual coaster. And you put it on the table where the banana was, like next to it. And now this thing thinks that what it's actually seeing is not a banana anymore, but a, but a toaster, okay? Think about this. Where do we use this technology? We use this technology, for example, in, in not in all, but in some autonomous vehicles to decide whether we see a stop sign or something else. And now, now it gets even more interesting. So this, you can say, oh, this is great. This is all theoretical stuff and so on and so forth. You can actually do this in the real world. So there's a so-called stop sign attack. What you do is you can place these white and black stickers that have certain patterns in a smart way on these stop signs. Okay. And now if you take your standard image classifier that has been trained to, to detect traffic signs, it will actually tell you that this is not a stop sign, but it's a 65 miles per hour 
speed limit sign, for example. Okay? Now, if you think about this, if you have an autonomous vehicle that is relying on parsing these uh, signage information for decision making, and I tell you this is not a stop sign, you can actually speed up, this is going to be a disaster, right? Or can be potentially be a disaster. That means we have to address these things in a different way. We probably need different ways of having additional map information and so on and so forth. But all that I want to say is that it's not so straightforward to deploy this technology. Just take it and put it somewhere and hope that things will work out uh, uh, the way we want it. All right. So that's basically all that I wanted to, to, to say in terms of giving you a bit of an introduction of where we are in terms of machine learning, what the risks are and what the possibilities are. What I would like to do now is I'd like to talk about machine learning and AI specifically in supply chain and logistics. So, and of course, if you think about this, there's various very natural application areas how you can think of using this technology in your supply chain logistics context. Of course, there's the all-time favorite that everybody will come up immediately, that's forecasting. Uh, and of course, it becomes even more interesting now that we have all these short-lived SKUs that are seasonal and we would like to find out a way of how to deal with this. So this talk is not going to be about forecasting. I will have one slide just to give you a bit of a perspective, but this talk is not going to be about forecasting. So then, of course, the other example that might come to mind very early on is dynamic routing. We are facing uh, more and more setups where we need to dynamically route something through a network, be it cars, be it packets, it doesn't really matter. And these networks are more and more volatile and we get information more and more dynamically. And now you would like to dynamically use that information to make better decisions. So that's uh, what I'm going to talk about. And this is, this is actually also something that we have implemented already a few years back and that has been running since then. Uh, the next one that I would like to talk about is, uh, is, is worker performance assessment. And, and you would see from what angle I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at this. And the idea is basically that if you have, say, a fulfillment center and you have workers, and maybe in the old days it was sufficient to do some time studies and then compute something like picks per hour as a metric. If you look at how tasks are performed nowadays, they are very complex and diverse. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very hard to assess whether a worker did a good job on a task or whether a worker did not good, uh, do a good job. And it's not so much about the actual performance of the worker, as we will see later, but much more of the overall efficiency of, say, the fulfillment center or the warehouse. And then uh, afterwards, I'm going to talk about something new that we just started, that's uh, dynamic inventory management. And there the idea is that you go away from this more stationary, uh, optimal policies that you have derived from your Bellman equations that we have all seen uh, probably a hundred times. But what we do is we rip this whole thing out and we replace this by deep reinforcement learning, which is a much more dynamic approach and allow, allows to dynamically adjust to changes in the demand patterns, dynamically learn seasonalities uh, and things like this. And uh, last but not least, of course, there's uh, another all-time favorite pricing, but that's a bit of the, out of the scope of this talk, so I'm not going to talk about pricing and that's for some other time. All right, let's start with forecasting. So my message is very simple, machine learning and forecasting, let's maybe not talk so much about forecasting. In fact, uh, there's extremely good libraries out there that do extremely high quality forecasts for you, for free, they are open source. It's for, for example, Facebook's profit library, uh, they open source it. It's, it's a great library, it includes seasonalities, you can put in calendar information, and so on and so forth. And the nice thing is, uh, it will outperform your traditional hold winters in a RIMA model significantly. It's very easy to use, it has been hardened, and so on and so forth. So that's my, the only statement that I want to make about forecasting. If you want to do forecasting, try out that library first, or many of the similar ones. And if it does not work then, well then uh, we can come back and talk about actual machine learning, because this thing solves many, many interesting cases that we believe that are not, un not solvable that easily before. And it uses some type of machine learning, just maybe not the deep learning that you would expect. So that's for forecasting. Now let's, let's talk a bit about the, 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 at least for me, more interesting things such as dynamic routing. So what's the overall task that we face or the problem that we want to solve? So the idea is that you want to route or tour through a network. Maybe you need to deliver goods to, to, uh, to to outlets, maybe you need to um, route packets uh, in a network, it doesn't really matter, that's your task. And um, of course, let's be realistic, in networks that we are car carrying for those days, you have a lot of feedback effects. There will be congestion, there will be delays, there will be all types of problems, links break down, uh, links slow down, and so on and so forth, right? That's what we're actually uh, facing nowadays. So what would have been a traditional approach? 
So the traditional approach when I, for example, uh, worked at uh, IBM iLog would have been you take a lot of historical data that you have, then you run some form of regression to get a rough idea how long it takes to transfer, transfer an edge, to traverse an edge, then you would set an optimization model, a very fancy one of course because you want to use CPLEX, and once you have done this you would solve your optimization model and you repeat. And at some point you would realize, well, you know, my solutions somehow don't look so great anymore, maybe I should collect more data, rerun my regression and repeat. That would have been the traditional approach in many, many cases. Now what, uh, what I suggest or what we did back there is, is like, it's a different approach and the idea is that you should do online learning. So the idea is of online learning is that this learning piece that you usually do in the beginning and then you do the optimization piece, you now do both things simultaneously. And this has, that has many, many advantages. It has, for example, the advantage that your learning never stops. Right? If I do this the traditional approach, I first learn, then I stop, then I optimize. Here both is integrated, so you never stop learning. You get more information, new things happen, you can adjust to them. And uh, so that's, that's the basic idea here. So just in a nutshell, if you, like the traditional approach, the idea is somehow to get a good solution every time. And here we relax this just a bit. We say, look, we don't want to get the best solution every time. We just want to get the very, very good solution almost all the times. And why do I want to relax this? Because I can use these other times to do a bit of exploration to figure out if there are uh, ways to traverse my network that are actually more efficient so I can actually learn, right? You have to trade off. Right? Like you have only limited time, let's say you optimize 95% of the time and the other 5% of the time you want to use for exploration to learn new things. So that's the basic idea um, uh, of what you want to do and then there's of course this exploration exploitation trade-off that occurs almost everywhere that you have to make a decision when you want to learn and when you want to use what you have learned. Good, so that's the basic setup. So, and I'm not going to, to, to bore you or bog you down with formulas here. I just want to give you a very fundamental idea that is behind this. And this very fundamental idea is what people call the regret. So the regret is, you say, look, what I want to do is the following thing. I want to find a dynamic policy that over time gets as good as the best stationary policy that I could have come up with. So the stationary policy corresponds to your, your I first regress and then optimize scenario, okay? So why do you want to do this? Well, if you, if you think about it, let's say you have to first collect data. You have to wait half a year until you have enough data before you can start the decision-making process. Here you do everything together. And what this equation really does is, so the FT is essentially the realization of the reality. Think of this as being the cost that you see in your network. The XT is your, let's say, routing decision in every time step T. And you benchmark the cost that you incur on average against the cost on average that you would have occurred if you would have traditionally just picked a single uh, solution after doing the regression, for example. And what you get is that this goes to zero at the rate of one over root t. So that means that over time, your dynamic policy will be at least as good as the stationary one. And in fact, in reality, it will be very often much better. So it means that you much more dynamically adjust to changes in the demand patterns or in the, in, the, in the delays of the network and so on and so forth. So you get a very nice dynamic routing approach that is extremely fast. And now the, the best thing of it all is, so there's many, many algorithms that do this. I mean, we know this for like 20 years. But the nicest thing about this is that there is a very interesting version of the algorithm, the so-called follow the perturb leader algorithm. It's actually due to Kala and Vampala, and Vampala is here at Jota Tech. And why is this such an amazing algorithm? Because you can reuse your old routing problem. So very, uh, most people have already set up some way of solving their routing decisions, right? And if I tell you now, hey, you know, I have this new approach, it's much better than what you have there, but you have to throw your old routing model away, it's not going to happen. I mean, let's be realistic. If you try to roll out something in the reality and you have processes in place and people have been working with the model for 20 years, you don't just show up at the door and say, hey, I have something better for you, right? It's just not working. But the nice idea is that this algorithm allows you to reuse your old model. So you add an algorithmic scheme around your already running algorithm and you just make the algorithm smart by adding something to it. And that's much nicer because you can actually implement this. And people are actually willing to implement, to, to do this because it's a very simple type of algorithm that runs around this and that makes it smart just by adding something to it. All right, good. So um, let me give you an example of how this looks like. I, I apologize that ahead of time that the graphics, graphics are a bit messy. They are a few years old and I could not regenerate them. Um, so what do you see here? So what you see is we look at a TSP instance. So what does it mean? We want to do a tour in a graph. I have a truck. I want to deliver product to certain outlets and the truck has to come home at the end of the day. That's my task, okay? And 
this is the network. I took a simple one, 60 nodes, okay? And what you see here, the blue lines are the optimal tours. This is an overlay of two tours that you see here, okay? These are the blue lines. And the green lines are the tours or the edges that the algorithm traverses by trying to learn the optimal tours, okay? So we know the blue ones, the algorithm does not, 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 know, not know the blue ones when it's going to run. And um, what is going to happen is that at time step 500, we will switch to a completely different regime. So think of something like, for whatever reason, we have no traffic jams or some streets break down and so on and so forth. And suddenly a completely different solution is going to be the optimal solution, not what you had beforehand. So you learn something, you're extremely confident that this is the optimal solution and suddenly something happens in your network and then you need to readjust to something new. Right? That is a scenario that we face very often. And let's see what happens. So let me see if I can do this in a smart way. Um, one second. Ah. Let me stop here for a second. So what you see here is, so what you, it's, I, I apologize, it's so bad to see, but this dashed line here, okay? This corresponds to the optimal way of traversing the graph at the current point in time. Where do I continue? Here, here, and here. Okay? That's the current optimal solution. The algorithm doesn't know this. The green lines are the tools that the algorithm is taking and it's actually taking tools to the graph, but also learning at the same time. The edge weights that you see, these thick edges, are edges that are used more often, so they are more likely to belong to the optimal tour. The thinner ones are the ones that are ta taken only once in a while to make sure that you're not missing something, you're actively exploring new solutions. Okay, now let's see what happens. So this is like a time step 56. So what happens is over time, the algorithm, if you look at this right now, we essentially have already learned the optimal tour. Okay? After very few iterations, we have found something that is extremely close to the optimal tour. And you see only very occasionally some of these green lines, which is when we explore and see whether there are other possibilities of actually getting a new tour that could be better. Okay? Let's keep this running. So this continues. And you see that the, the green lines will be a fewer and fewer because we explore less and less over time. And then time step 500 comes. That happens in a few seconds like now. So what you see now, now a completely different tool is optimal, okay? You see that I have these blue lines now that were not there beforehand, and you also see that the algorithm hasn't even taken this tool once. It's a completely different tool. Think of some streets broke down or the, some bridges crashed like we had in Atlanta. So you have to take a completely different tool, but the algorithm doesn't know yet that this is the optimal tool. And then what it does is it continues, it figures out that the current tool is not good anymore, and starts to learn which are the new tool, which is the new tool that is actually competitive. And you see that we are starting to traverse these new edges again. You see the blue green ones here, that means that we take these edges in our routing. Good, and this continues and so on and so forth. Now how good is this? Let's look at the actual cost. So what do you see here? It's, a, it's an ugly graph, I know, but let me tell you what you see. The red line here is the cost of taking the of taking the optimal route in each time step, okay? That's what the red line is. And we calibrated the cost so that they are the same for all these tours. Why? Because if there's a big difference between the cost of the tours, it's very easy to learn the new tour. So we make sure that you cannot just look at the cost of the tour to differ differentiate if a tour is optimal or not. So we took a lot of the reward signal away, which is very important. It makes it actually much, much harder. Okay, so this is what you see. This is the red one here. This is an optimal cost for in every time step to achieve what you try to do. Then what we have is the blue one. The blue one is the cost incurred by our algorithm, and the green one is the deviation from the optimal cost that would have been achievable with perfect foresight into the future. So what do we see? We see that at the beginning we start out with some random costs, right, because we just took a random tour we have to explore, and then you see that the cost is very sharply decreasing to a point where we are essentially optimal. You see this, right, we're very close to the red line. And I say essentially optimal because we are actively exploring with, I don't know, the rate was probably between 3 and 5%. So every 3 and 5% we take a suboptimal tour just for the, making sure that we are not missing something. If I would not be doing this, I would be completely missing this spike here. So what happens at time step 500? At time step 500, something happens in my network. What it means is I suddenly change the cost in the network drastically from one step to another. So what happens, my old tour that the algorithm is still taking most of the time, Right? It be, because it believed that this is the great, uh, the, uh, the great tour to take to bring the cost down, suddenly becomes very, very expensive. 
that's what you see here. So the cost jumps up, and you see it's like more than a factor of three that it jumps up by, okay? So it's a very expensive tool. But then the algorithm realizes that it's not optimal anymore and starts to again uh, learn that this new tool is optimal. And then after another 150 iterations, you get again back to a point where the cost that you're incurring for your dynamically uh, learned tool is essentially the same as taking the optimal tool if you would have known it, which you don't know in reality. So what does it tell you? It tells you that there's a learning algorithm that you can use for routing. And actually, this one is running in reality on reword large-scale networks that, that learns which are the optimal tools to take if you don't know ahead of time what the edge cost or the times for traversing the graph will be. Now, the interesting thing about these algorithms is if you look at the convergence rate for those of you that are into numbers, it doesn't look so great. It's just 1 over root t. The key point, however, though, is that it's dimension independent. That means this is as fast on my 60-node example as it is essentially on my 600-million-node example. There's a very small trade-off in the logarithmic term in the number of nodes. But otherwise, uh, it will be extremely fast. So that means that these algorithms scale very well from my toy example here to real-world deployment. And that's why people love to use them in real-world applications. So that's in terms of dynamic routing. What I would like to talk about now is uh, uh, worker performance assessment. So that's a completely different type of application where we use machine learning. Uh, and the idea is essentially, and I will talk about why you want to do that in a second, you want to measure and assess worker performance, for example, in a fulfillment center. Okay. Now, why do you want to do this? I'll talk about this in a second. But let's talk a bit about what people have been doing in that space uh, more traditionally. So you come up with some metric, maybe of picks per hour, maybe you adjust this bit by the task that you would like to do. Maybe you take the geometry of the work uh, warehouse into consideration. Maybe you do a couple of time studies and so on and so forth. And you try to derive a model from this. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, I just had a question before yeah. about the dynamic routing. Yeah. So in this case, I was just wondering whether uh, maybe I'm understanding this incorrectly, uh, the fact that you're putting certain more weight on the coefficients that you're obtaining on the last section of your route, right? When you're doing your dynamics, so that your algorithm learns from those coefficients faster uh, to be able to accommodate uh, to that last iteration, right? When you prepare your system. Yeah, I, I know. I, I know what you mean. So the the answer is so the 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 theoretical answer is no. You don't need to. You actually check the average over all rounds that you have seen so far, and you can still show that it's optimal. What you do in reality to speed up learning, you take a discount factor, similar how you do in reinforcement to learning, to put more weights on more recent decisions. But it's typically a very mild discount factor. Okay. It's like maybe 0.95 or something. Yeah, and I was just wondering whether in that example, you, like, there were different types of discount factors. No, right? none. This was without. This was completed yeah. completely without, yes. Good. So let's talk a bit about this worker performance assessment example. So yeah, so typically you come up with some metrics and you try to assess the performance uh, uh, of, of workers. Now, reality, if you go to a modern fulfillment center, is very different. Why? Well, first of all, it's very high paced. We have very small orders those days. Actually, if you take your favorite uh, uh, e-commerce company, most of the orders will actually be singleton orders. So you pick only one item per order, okay? But you pick multiple into a tote, okay? So there's a lot of challenges coming with this. How, where do you put product? What correlations do you want to consider to keep product close together so that you can reduce uh, time to pick things and so on and so forth. Then there's questions, where do you pick? Do you pick from the golden zone in the middle? Do you have to kneel down? Do you have to take a ladder to go up? How heavy is the item? What's the dimension of the item? Is it, is it, is it fragile? Is it maybe beauty products? There's many, many things that you have to consider in terms of picking that impact how fast you are. There's also things that depend on how long have you been working on the shift? Have I made you actually pick heavy things for the last two hours? And yes, at some point your performance is going to go down, right? So there's all these contextual things, all these environmental things that you actually want to like to put into consideration to make a fair assessment of performance, okay? So, why do you want to do this? Well, at the end of the day, you would like to learn a model that, te that gives you the possibility. You tell me what the task is. You tell me a bit of the history of the work essay that tells you, or gives you a very good prediction of how long the task should take. And let's say in, in, in math speak, 
you would like to have something like an unbiased estimator. So it gives you a fair estimate of the time in expectation and maybe it gives you some standard deviation that you should expect for this to make sense, okay? Now, why would you care? And the, the key thing is, it's not why you think that you should care. The first thing if I say you want to assess worker performance is to think about evaluating whether a, per, a person by itself is over or underperforming so that you can make higher or fire decision. That's actually not the point. That's actually a very, very small component of a bigger puzzle. Why you care for being able to assess the performance is actually in the cases that we worked on for completely different reasons. So first of all, you would like to detect whether you have issues in your fulfillment center. Maybe at, at peak times around the holidays, you suddenly realize that there are issues in the, in the fulfillment center and the reason why the performance is going down of specific workers is because in a certain area you have a problem, right, for example. The other thing is you would like to do A-B testing on associate training. Right? There's like, how do you, how do you, what, what strategy do you teach the associates in terms of picking and so on and so forth, replenishing? What's the impact of this? So you can do A-B testing once you can assess the performance. You can A-B test new uh, WMS policies. How you, how, you, um, how you pick and uh, how you store, how do you replenishments and so on and so forth. Um, and what become more, became more and more important, you can do real-time workload shaping on a per worker basis. What does it mean? It means if you can track the performance over time and you realize that somebody, for example, is getting tired, you can assign the person to easier tasks for some time. You can also say, oh, this person seems to be very good at dealing with beauty items and gift wrapping them, for example. And this person seems to be not be doing so good at it. Maybe you can actually assign the right person to the right task. And if you do this, you have a win-win in the system, right? And um, so what this in this case gives rise to is a large optimization model where you want to uh, actually maximize the throughput that you have in the system and um, you solve this optimization problem then you get an optimal assignment. Um, but very often you're also interested in doing this type of performance tracking over longer periods of time. Why? First of all, you want to prevent bur worker burnout over time. And if you see that over months a worker's performance is going down, then maybe you want to pay very close attention to what's going on. But this is one component. The other component is uh, that if you introduce a new technology, maybe you introduce new guns, right, for scanning, then whenever you introduce a new technology, the short-term impact is typically negative because people have to get used to it. So you have to track over a longer period of time whether it actually makes sense. Right, that's why you would like to be able to track this over a longer period of time. And last but not least, there's many changes that you can do to your fulfillment center or warehouse, replenishment policies, tote sizes, like if you make bigger tones, you have to carry more. Does it slow you down? Right? It's a trade-off between carrying a lot and carrying a lot often and things like this. So, yeah, so what, what did we do? So traditionally you probably have done some form of a regression type of approach, maybe a bit of nonlinear regression. You cook up your feature vectors, you come up with something that somehow represents what's going on in your, work, uh, in your warehouse or in your fulfillment center. And then you will realize if you do your first regression that you get an arbitrarily bad R squared. Why? Because this thing is highly nonlinear. Just think about this, right? Like if you want to pick something and you don't pick it from the middle and you have to bend down, then this costs you time. But let's say the second item that you pick is right next to it. You're already bent down, so it's not going to cost you any additional time. So all these things are extremely dynamic and non-linear. If you just run your traditional regression, you will get a very, very, very bad R squared. So what we did is we came up with something else which is much more complicated where you look at the full context and you don't try to cook this down into just feature vectors. And what happens now is, I mean, it's a combination of deep learning, extra trees and random forests. But what you get then is you get an R squared, like a generalized R squared because for these machine learning models you don't have the residuals in that traditional form anymore, of 0.6 to 0.7. Okay? That's what you get. Now the question is, is this a good or a bad R squared? So, you know, if you, if you take your traditional examples, you would say, ah, you know, that it could be higher. Uh, I argue, actually, that it should not be much higher than that. Why? Because you want a model that learns the base characteristics of the tasks that you're wanting to do. But you don't want this model to start to overfit because you want the model not to incorporate worker variations because that's precisely what you want to measure. If I, have a, if I want an unbiased estimator, my estimator should be blind to which worker is ex uh, doing the task. And that creates variation that you should not be explaining with your R squared. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there will be many tasks, especially at peak times, where the execution will not be nominal. Maybe an item is dropped, maybe you have a miss because the item is supposed to be there, but it's not there. So the task will take much longer than it was supposed to take. 
You cannot explain these things, you cannot expect to explain these things, and you should not try to explain them, because if you would explain them, you would be overfitting. So in R squared of 0 0.6, 2.7 is actually very good in that context. And we trained this on like 10, about 10 million individual data points, and gives you a very finely grained model, and again, this is also something that is deployed and in use uh, as of now. And just to give you an idea how this looks at the end of the day, what do you see here? These are all the tasks, all these dots are a task. Down here you see the true duration of the task that it actually took to perform the task. And here you see what the model predicted how long this task should take. And what you see is that this is all very nicely uh, spread around this line here. But you see also some very interesting things here. Like for example, you have nothing here, but a lot here. Why is this so? Well, these are tasks that should have taken 40 seconds, for example, but took lo much longer because there was some irregularity with the task. Maybe somebody dropped an item, maybe something was not in place, and so on and so forth. So the model captures exactly what you want. All the irregularities you have here, because these are when things take longer than expected. For the bulk of the points, you have them nicely centered around your uh, main diagonal, which would be the perfect prediction line. And you see that the, de by the density that most of this is concentrated here. Okay, so, and that, as I said, this is, this is in use and this works actually uh, very well to assess performance. Unfortunately, I cannot give you exact numbers because it's actually in use. Good. So, um, that's what I wanted to say in terms of uh, worker performance assessment. And then my last example uh, is actually something that we very recently started. And that's about inventory management. And so, what is inventory management? So, let me give you my layman's dis, uh, definition of what inventory management is. You want to essentially provide a product for production maintenance or service uh, at the minimum stock level with the highest possible service level. So, your trade-off will be a service level versus a stock level. If I put everything in my warehouse, I don't care for cost, I have perfect service level. If I put nothing in my warehouse, I will always stock out uh, and I have the worst service level, but I have minimum cost. Okay? If I don't count, account for stockout costs. Good. So what's the idea here? So the tra traditional approach somehow is, in most applications, you look at the demand, you make some assumptions about the demand, and then after you have made your de demand assumptions, you run a bit of forecasting, maybe you try to guess what the distribution of the demand is, and then you take some policy that you derive from the Bellman equation, so some stationary policy that becomes the inventory management policy, something like SS, and you will run this. And then you say, well, this is what is going on. And if you look at various of the WMS softwares out there, they actually use these things still nowadays. So it's what I would consider very often the standard approach if you don't do something uh, smarter. Good. What's the problem with this? The problem with this is that these things are typically derived under very, very strong assumptions. So you make assumptions like my costs are linear, my demand is independent, many, many assumptions that actually in reality almost never hold. And that's a problem if you deploy these things because you don't, you don't even know how bad your policy is. And very often you cannot solve the actual inventory management problem in real time, so you don't really know. So what we started to do, and this is, as I said, this is ongoing work with one of my students that is also sitting over there. Um, so the idea here is that you do deep reinforcement learning for inventory control. What's the idea? The idea is that you, 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 you feed this model and we see what it gets, and it automatically learns what the optimal control policy is given the observed demand in the system. Okay? Why do you want to do this? Well, first of all, you want to do this because you don't need to know anything. You literally just dump in the data and you let it happen. Sure, there's a lot of model tuning going on and so on and so forth, but you don't need to make any assumptions and that is a very, very big difference. Um, so the only thing that you actually observe is the state of the system, how much do you have in your warehouse, maybe uh, then you have your actions, how much can I reorder if I want to, what's the lead time and so on and so forth. And then you have rewards. So that is essentially, I tell you, you did a good decision or you did a bad decision. If you stock out, that's probably, you did something wrong in the past if you stock out. So you should pay for this. If you hold too much inventory, it's expensive, you should pay for this. If you run minimum inventory, that's great, you don't pay for this. So, and we want, we want to do is we want to maximize, say, the reward. Uh, of course, there's a lot of issues with this, also as with any, all things. Convergence can be slow, and for many of the actual reward problems where the problem is highly nonlinear, it might actually, in principle, happen that it doesn't converge at all. Reality is a bit different because it's stochastic and so on and so forth. It typically converges very nicely in applications. 
And the way of how you should think, what is deep reinforcement learning? Think of the same thing that people did before and by solving these Bellman equations to obtain the policies, but now you do this numerically and dynamically with an algorithm using the data. So you solve the same problem. Deep reinforcement learning also solves the same problem as your Bellman equation solves. It's just dynamic. So it's a numerical algorithm to use the data to do this dynamically in a model-free context. Good. What can you do? Let's first talk about the setup. So a typical setup is you have an agent. That's the inventory controller, let's say. And the guy can do something, an action. The action is order 10 more units at time step t. That's an action. And then the environment does something with it. So you execute your order, product arrives with a certain lead time, so you go to a new system state. And from that new system state here, ST1, you get a reward. And the reward could be, in our case, it's just the inventory cost that we had at the last time step. That's a fair reward because we can roughly estimate what it is. We know what we have in the warehouse. We know how often we stocked it and so on and so forth. We just use past information, no future information, obviously. Good. So how do you do this? Again, I'm not going to want to go to the details. There are some algorithms that do this typically in reinforcement learning. One of them is Q-learning. It's a stochastic uh, uh, descent type of algorithm. You, have, you maintain this table Q here, which tells you for a given state what the reward of the actions would be if you would take them approximately. That's what you learn, this magical table Q. It's a lookup table. If I have seven thing in my, things in my warehouse, my demand in the last 10 periods was like this, what am I going to do? That's what this table contains. As you can imagine, if you think about it, when I say it like this, in reality, this thing will be huge. It's a big lookup table that tells you, if my state is this, do that. Problem is, you can't save it. And that's actually why the traditional reinforcement learning approaches, although we know about them for a very, very long time, have never been really used in that context. Now, the idea is you do something different. You say, look, I take this Q table that I cannot maintain, I just rip it out, and I rep replace it by a deep neural network. So I learn an approximation of this table that is good enough for my actual learning test. It's not as comprehensive as the full table, but I don't need the full table. I just need a good approximation of the table, and I put this network in there to do this for me. And that's the idea of re deep reinforcement learning in a nutshell. You throw out the Q table, and you put in the deep neural network to replace the Q table. OK, so what can you do? Let me give you first a, 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 a simple example that should convince you that this actually does something that is meaningful. <coughs> So let's look at something that we understand. Let's look at the traditional setup where the SS policy would be optimal. Okay, that's the setup here. So what do you see here? You see four pictures. The way of how you should read this, what you see here on the left is what the DQN does. So this is a deep reinforcement, that's a deep, uh, deep reinforcement learning based algorithm. And what you see here is what the SS policy does. Blue is the demand, yellow is the inventory that we maintain. Down here, we see the order sizes. Yellow, uh, uh, this yellow here or orange here is what the SS policy does. Blue is what the network did. And then here, you see the reward signal that was feed to the DQN only. The SS doesn't have a reward, reward signal, but we plotted the rewards as well so that you get an idea what's going on. Okay? This is after 30 training episodes, so essentially nothing. We just started. This is just random guessing. And you see that my SS policy has a reward of about 700 in this case and my DQN gets a reward of minus 2,500. I mean, you can look at it, it's, it's crap, okay? Now let's see what happens after we start training. So now we are after about 500 episodes. So you see my, my reward is already 419 compared to 651. And you see, before I was like uh, stocking up all the time at maximum inventory, and you see I'm already not stocking up that much anymore. It still doesn't look as nice as I would like it to be, but we are slowly getting there. And you see that my order sizes are already somewhat aligned with what the SS policy would be doing, which is not completely unexpected because the SS policy is optimal. Just to be very clear how we, how we came up with the numbers here, so the SS policy is actually more optimal than possible in some sense because we optimize the parameters after the fact. So you would never get these parameters that we used here for the SS policy because we optimized them after the fact to make sure that there's nothing better out there in terms of SS policies, okay? Good. So now let's see what happens after 850 iterations. So after 850 iterations, we essentially have the same re uh, reward that the SS policy has. Sure, our reordering patterns here, our order sizes are a bit different. They are a bit more random. That's because we still explore once in a while a bit and we allow it to order a bit less or more. But essentially you see that the type of order is very closely matches what the SS policy does. And that's also what you see up here in, in terms of uh, the reward signal. 
Now, if you look at it over time, what you see here, so in the upper row, you see what happens within the training process. And what you see on the lower one is, is what happens in deployment, okay, after you're done with training. If you would just take it as is and you would deploy it. You usually don't do this, but this is just for illustration. So what you see here is you start, so the green one now is the random policy. We just randomly order. Okay, that's your benchmark. That's the worst possible benchmark that you can somehow come up with. That's if you don't know anything about reality, you just order random or you just order the average or something like this, okay? So you see that the neural network, because at the beginning it doesn't know anything either, it starts at the same point, but it's very fast picking up to get close to what the SS policy does. And you see it, it's, it's, it's converging to it, and then there's a dip. i talk about this dip in a second. And then it continues and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at this in terms of prescriptiveness, so prescript, prescriptiveness is a number, is a coefficient that captures how much of the information in the data did you actually do, use. Okay, that's what prescriptive, it's like R squared for, for learning problems. You want to know how good, how much of the data did you use that was in your model. Then what you see is here, the prescriptiveness goes very close to one. We cannot go over one in this example because this is SS, which is optimal. And then there's this drop, I talk about the drop in a second. And if the, in the trained out model you see that we are essentially very, very close to one. So we get essentially very, very close to this hyper-optimal policy that you can never come up in reality just by learning from the reward data and feeding it in. And there's no model behind it. I just fit the state, the reward signal, that's it. Okay? So what's this dip? So what is, that's actually a very interesting uh, example. What happens here is the algorithm explores. So once in a while the algorithm says, hey, you know, what would happen if I just don't order anything? And let's just like incur the, the stock out costs, right? Maybe once in a while I do one order here. And you see this is the green line here. And then it figures out, oh, maybe not so, such a good idea. <laughs> Let me go back to where I was beforehand. Right? And that's how this whole training setup works. It's highly, highly non-linear and non-convex, but the algorithm explores and finds new solutions to your problem. Good. So that's, that's just giving you an idea, yes, if you deploy it the right way, you're essentially as good as what you would get if you would derive these policies under the same assumption. This is, of course, under the assumption where SS is optimal. If you would not have these assumptions, then uh, it makes no sense. Good. Now, you can, take this, you can take the whole thing a bit further. So you take the same setup, but what we do now is, let's say, you know, you don't have demand that satisfies the requirements for SS optimality. Let's say, now I, I add uh, seasonalities. Every second week on Sunday, suddenly the demand goes randomly up. This is what you see here. These are the orange spikes. And again, same setup here. And this is slightly different graphics uh, uh, because these were different runs. Um, but what you see here is like in the beginning, again, the network essentially just orders some random number all the time, something like half of the demand. And you see the reward is pretty bad, right? And what happens now over time is after 50, it already went up significantly. Forget what the reward in numbers means. It's not so important. What is important if you look at the picture, what's happening here, you see that it already starts to get much closer to explaining these peaks here. And if we repeat this a bit further, so you see in the order structure, we already get some structure here in the orders. They're not completely random anymore. Uh, now you see we start to somehow mimic the same spikes that we had in the seasonalities here um, even more. Now, these are still a bit, a bit wide because it's, uh, the, the model hasn't really figured out yet where the spike is going to come. So it orders wide around the spike to make sure that it has the inventory when it needs it. That's why they are, they are so wide here. But what happens then, after a few more extra iterations, the model actually figures out that every second Sunday, I have this extra demand for whatever reason, without you ever telling the model. And it actually learns an order policy that you can see here, that the day before the demand comes actually bumps up the inventory. So here was now, there was like no lead time involved and so on and so forth, but you can do the same thing with lead time, okay? Good. Very nice. Now you say, well, this is great. You, this is just academic examples. Let's see what happens if you take the same thing and now you deploy it to something else. So we take the same model. Literally, it's the same model. I just stopped the timer and now, now I switched the uh, environment. So I took the environment that I had beforehand. But now the cost change. Say, for whatever reason, my holding costs go down dramatically and the profit that I get for selling an item goes up significantly. Why does it change? Because if you look here in the last picture, you see that given how the inventory is handled, I never build up inventory early, which I would usually do if I expect a big spike. Why? Because my holding costs were really high here. Now let's see what happens if I change the holding cost, that it actually starts to make sense to build up inventory. 
So what happens is the following. So suddenly the cost changes. The model gets very confused. Why? Because it has a prediction of what the reward should be for an action, and now I give you a completely different reward. So your expectation of what reality will be and what you actually get from reality back from the environment are very different. So the model essentially gets very confused. What, ha what happens is it starts to explore new policies. And what then happens after, again, 800 iterations here, it essentially finds policies that build up inventory early and then actually sell it off because now it's very cheap to build up inventory. Again, I haven't done any changes. I run the same model. I feed the same data. Nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed in the environment that the model is blind to, the co I mean, it gets it in terms of the reward. The cost has changed, but nothing else. Okay? Good. Now, for those of you that think about this for five minutes, they would say, well, that's all fair and square. But let's be realistic. You tell me you need 850 training episodes. Let's play real world. A training episode is a day, because you need inventory demand for a day, let's say. That's 850 days. That's uh, not feasible. It's never going to happen. By the time that you have learned something with the amazing algorithm, reality has changed and it doesn't make any sense anymore. And that actually is one of the biggest challenges for most machine learning systems in the physical world. Because getting the data is typically a slow process. And it, takes, it costs money to generate the data typically, and it's slow. So you, there's, there's, a, there's a limit on that resource. It's not like Google and Facebook where you have 100 billion pictures that you can use for training. It's not like this. So you have to come up with something. So the idea, of course, would be, well, build a simulator. Build a good simulation and use the simulation to pre-train the model. Now, if you think about it for two seconds, you say, well, that, that's a great idea, but that's going to fail. Why? Because if you train in a simulated environment, you're over-optimizing to that environment. The moment I put you in the real world, what you've learned in the environment is not going to fit anymore to the real world, and you're actually performing bad. And that's a very valid concern. People are very much aware of this in deep reinforcement learning. But what it turns out, what you can show is you can make reinforcement learning robust. So you can robustify this training process so that you can actually start to train in a simulated environment and then once you're done with pre-training in a simulated environment, you can deploy it in the real-world environment. And that, of course, you can do much faster, because in the simulated environment, 850 episodes are nothing. I do this in two minutes. Okay? In the real world, it takes me three years, almost three years. Okay? So that's why this is a very nice type of thing. And it's, it's a very simple setup, just to give you an idea for those of you that know Q-learning. What it really comes down to in the end is that you add an uncertainty reward term in your training equation in a smart way. And you can do the same thing for, for TD, for Q-learning, for SARSA. These are the standard learning algorithms that you might know from the textbooks. But you can also do this for neural network-based ones, like the ones that I'm using here, by robustifying the training process. And then you actually can pre-train in a simulated environment, and then you can deploy in an environment that is very different. Not very different. I mean, it has to be similar. But it's, I mean, you don't need to get all the details right. And then what happens is that the policy will be fine-tuned by real-world uh, deployment. All right, good. So these were the examples that I wanted to talk about. Let me uh, finish with a very quick summary. So I think uh, if you think about uh, using AI and machine learning and supply chain and logistics, there's many, many different ways of how you can use it. And I would say that the journey really has uh, just started. And what I found very important is when you look at new technologies, there's a lot of new technologies out there, but very often they don't scale to real-world applications. And that makes them very excited in the classroom or for research but not really something that can drive innovation in the real world. And I think that is the reason why people are so excited about machine learning, because these things tend to scale very well if done right. And uh, that's the case in all these things that we have seen. All these things are implementable or implemented, depending on the application. Um, what is also very interesting is that for most of these approaches, if done right, you can actually reuse already present infrastructure. That's important. Nobody's going to rip out a WMS just because you show up. It's not going to happen. Nobody's going to throw out the algorithm and say, oh, we just we start, we start fresh. We just throw out all the IT and we do our own IT. It's not going to happen. So if you have something that can integrate with things that are there already, systems that are in place, and you integrate with them nicely, that has a much, much higher probability of actually being rolled out or implemented. And many of these machine learning type of approaches, they can do this. Reinforcement learning, for example, needs nothing. It needs the, what is going on in the system, what it can do, and you say whether this was a good or a bad decision. It's pretty simple. Same with the dynamic routing. You take the routing that is in place already at the company, and you just add this machine learning hull around this, which is a Python script, 50 lines of Python code, 
and it works. Okay? Good. And yeah, so why, why do you care? Because at the end of the day, it's always about money, and uh, if you can get something out fast, you get faster return on investment, and that's a nice thing. But as I said, I think we are really only at the beginning, so there's very exciting things out there. For example, generative adversarial networks that will have many, many applications. So the, the way of how you should think of GANs is you should think of two networks playing against each other. So you can look at very interesting situations where you, for example, look at a company and you look at the competitors and you have them play it out. But you have to play them it out not with static agents, but with agents that learn while doing it. Because that's what you really care for. Whenever we do these competitive analysis, right, we come up with something, what could the competition do, but we don't know. Right? And that's different here because you have two networks that have essentially the same power play against each other and figure it out. And uh, yeah, so and what we also see is, of course, we have a much higher uh, integration those days uh, with data. Data is much more available. And if you can now integrate your inference mechanism with a data stream, so you can do real-time type of predictions, there are so many, many applications where you can use this, where you can cut down cycles and re-optimize in reality and so on and so forth. All right, that's all that I had to say. Thank you very much. So I, per I mean, okay, uh, that's a biased statement, obviously, but let me try to unbias it a bit. Uh, I do think that the impact can be very high because with the companies that I'm working with, one of the biggest challenges that I see is a significant increase in speed with which things are happening, where traditional planning approaches don't apply anymore. And the other thing that I see is a, a significant increase in diversity of the problems that have to be solved. Right? Like in the old days, uh, you know, when I built my optimizations model at the start, I built an optimization model for a problem, and it was a very pure type of thing. The problems nowadays involve data, simulation, decision making, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a huge place for leveraging these technologies in supply chain logistics. Yes, exactly, yeah. Uh, environmental biases yes. or something like that. Very good point. I mean, this applies the same way to manufacturing as well. I mean, I took the example that we worked on and what we implemented, but yeah, sure, you can use this the same way for manufacturing-related uh, uh, performance assessment questions. Yeah. Thanks. I was just wondering, in, in your example here, the last one, um, did you consider besides anything of uh, the inventory uh, holding costs, if you consider your different types of service levels or your order size uh, costs, uh, fluctuations or... So, yeah, so in the examples that I showed here, to keep them simple, no, but you can. I mean, it's, you just change the action space. You can, I mean, the action doesn't have to be, have to order a single thing. You can say you can only order in batches of 20, for example, or things like this. We do have stock cost, stock out costs in this example that I showed you. Lead time is a non-issue to, uh, to, to add, uh, seasonalities. Everything that you can map into the state space or the action space can be done. Be by including those extra 
It's not so much, honestly. So uh, I think you can run this for very, very large scale problems. In fact, I mean, we, are, we run the same algorithms to play computer games. And there your state space is huge. You, I mean, the state space is the image that you observe on the screen. So, and, I mean, there's a very, very large number of images. So, I mean, sure, I mean, more costs more at the end of the day, also in resources, but I do think it scales. I mean, we have implemented other similar things with the same technology with much, much larger state spaces and action spaces, and it works. I mean, I mean it's not so much, actually, it's not so much, to, to be very precise, it's not so much a question of if it takes more, because I define the size of the network. It's, the question is rather, how good is the approximation? Okay, so it's a trade-off between the network size. Like here, we use three layers, 60 nodes per layer, and we have a different action and value network, right? But I, I can do many, many more complex network architectures, and that costs more time. Not necessarily the, si the size of the state space or the action space, because you force it into the same network size. at it essentially one of the message that is going on is that uh, you just apply this very generic neural network or mm -hmm. something of that style and get it a lot of data and mm -hmm. in fact you can almost forget all the domain knowledge based mm -hmm. type of optimization mm -hmm. models that, mm -hmm. that, that are taking into consideration all the constraints yes. and everything that somehow the neural network will be smart enough it would be learning to, to, to learn how to mm -hmm. do it. Uh, you foresee that this will be good for 90% of problems or as we grow or, or it's going to be kind of a combination, okay, embedded in yes. domain knowledge. And so, 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 okay, it's a very complicated question. Let me maybe answer this in a twofold way. So A, I of course pick my examples to make that point, okay? I picked examples where I can take out of the box things to show what you can do. If I tell you I can get it done, but I have engineered it for five months, you would not be impressed, right? It works by taking something out of the box. But I think the real opportunity is to take this and actually combine this with domain knowledge. Because then you get the, the, you get the domain knowledge for everything that you know ahead of time, which is static. And then you add intelligence on top of this to make it flexible in the areas that you cannot foresee. So you get the best of both worlds. And I think that is the way to go down the road. I mean, you don't get the training data, I mean, in reality. That it works when you have a physical model to some extent that helps you map that and improve training. So I think the real opportunity is to combine both. I'll go for another one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, related to your simulations, uh, there are kind of two kinds of simulation. You've got like the small simulation mm -hmm. that is built just to test your model. Mm -hmm. And then you've got other simulations mm -hmm. like we do a lot, mm -hmm. which is like a large-scale fine granularity mm -hmm. simulations that are very near to, to real data mm -hmm. that will be like yes. two, one, two, three years of data from which we generate a mm -hmm. bunch of things. But now you've got a lot of complexity going on in mm -hmm. there. So when you were talking about training, uh, I think that somehow training in such simulations uh, can alleviate a bit of the issues that mm -hmm. you had about the replicate and the fact that you're yes. dependent on, on the simulation model. Yes. So I, I fear a lot from the yeah. first, uh, first type of simulation, but not that much with the No, other. no, no, and that's exactly what you do. So you build a simulation that captures, like it's a complex simulation, it's not like a just testing. Yeah. It's a very complex simulation that tries to get very close to what is happening in the physical processes. But still, it's just a simulation. And then you do this form of robust training that is essentially blind to these very small changes. Mm -hmm. Right? And yeah, no, it makes a big difference. And that is, I, I think, also the way to go to generate the data, because you cannot let something run for two years to generate the data in the real world. Right. Yeah, I agree. Okay, good. Any final question for anybody? Okay, good. Uh, Professor uh, Pokuta is, uh, is in the ISY school, uh, so he's easy to get by when he's not traveling. Uh, so feel free if you've got any, uh, any idea, okay, any questions you may have. Uh, feel free to contact him. Uh, if you have any idea for research, for innovation, uh, he'll love, probably love to talk to you about it. Either you come from academia or industry. And at the Supply Chain Logistics Institute, we thank you all for coming here. And hopefully we'll see you next time, okay, with the uh, uh, always very nice uh, speaker with personal type of talks. On this, thank you very much. Thanks.